Right. Open your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter number 17. We're going to begin reading with verse number 8 and read uh, through verse number 16. If you would, I will read the even verses and you read the odd. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, Right. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it uh, for me and my son, that we may eat and die. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail unto the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake. By Elijah. Please join us now as we look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we continue our study of Elijah uh, and try to learn some things that are beneficial to our lives today, uh, help us to glean those facts, those realities, uh, so that we can be effective in all that we do, never discouraged, always looking to you knowing that we are in your hands and that you care and provide for us. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, we sent Elijah to Dry Brook University. He graduated. He has a diploma. God has moved him. He trusted God to take care of him even in the most difficult of situations. He trusted God to send ravens. Now, we know that ravens are a scavenger. They normally would not provide food to you. They would take food from you. But he trusted God and did as God had told him. He trusted him to supply him using water from the little brook Cherith. And he watched as God allowed the little brook Uh, to slowly dry up. And so God sends him to another difficult situation because his training is not not over yet. Now he's he's about to uh, to enroll in the empty barrel graduate school. Uh, He got his diploma last week. Now he's going to graduate school and learn some more things uh, that God will have for him. At Cherith, God broke his flesh. He taught him to depend upon him and him alone. At Zarephath, God's going to break his pride. He will learn that God calls all the shots of life, regardless of the circumstances. He's going to learn also, and we need to be aware of these things. Things are not always the way they seem. And they're not always as bad as they look. God's still in control. And if we know that he's in control, uh, we have no worry about the problems of life. It just depends on where you are in your relationship with him. Would the average person have gone to the brook and waited on ravens to feed them? I think not. 
Would the average person in this case now go to a, a widow and look for some uh, food and drink? Probably not. We'll discuss some of this. But he's going to learn that God can use the humblest of means to tra uh, train his children for his glory. By the time we get to chapter 18, we will see why God put him through such rigorous training. God's teaching him to be a man of God. As we started last week in, in our, our study, uh, he's not called a man of God. He's, he is called Elijah the uh, Tishbite. But by chapter 18, he's gone through his training. He's gotten his diplomas. And God is going to, and God calls him a man of God. And so that's what he's, we're looking to. You know, there are times for you and there are times for me when it seems that our trials come back to back and back to back. And sometimes we get under that, that, the stress of those trials and we say, will it ever end? Has God forgotten about me? Now, one thing we learned last week, when the brook dried up and the ravens quit feeding, it wasn't because Elijah had done the wrong thing. Elijah was in God's will at that time. It did mean that God had a different method now, a different way of training, and wanted to move him into those areas. So sometimes, as, as we said last week, just because things are going bad does not mean that you've done anything wrong. It could actually mean that you're exactly where God wants you to be, and now he's ready to move you up to graduate school, if we can say it that way. When these tough times come, we may be tempted to question the Lord. Lord, what are you doing? Don't you know what's going on? But it may be that God's getting you in a position where he can use you in a greater way. So in verse 8, we see a call. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, God hadn't forgotten about Elijah. The brook was dry, but God hadn't forgotten. And so again, the word of the Lord comes to him. God knew all about the dry brook. He knew about the situation. The dry brooks of life are those things which God uses to move us along in his will. He uses these brooks to teach you fresh lessons of faith and obedience. Now yours may not be a physical brook, but when it seems like life is not going right and things are just not working, it may be God has some special lessons. Maybe it's a new direction that he wants to move you into in his life, in your life. So those dried brooks are the things that God uses to help us. This lesson is a lesson of genuine faith that God wants us to learn. And when we have that faith, we know that faith waits for God to reveal his plans. When things aren't going well, we might need to sit by a dry brook waiting on the will of God to be revealed. But God in his perfect timing will reveal to us what he wants to do with our life. We have the tendency, now I'm sure none of you do, just me, to run ahead of God. Try to figure things out and leave God out of the planning. That's a tendency that most of us have. But the lesson is this, genuine faith 
waits for God to reveal his plans. It will sit by that brook waiting until it's revealed. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31, most of you are familiar with. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But I want you to notice when we have that verse, it says they that wait upon the Lord. Not those that run ahead of him. Not those that know more than he knows. Those who trust him. We tend to be in our society an action-oriented people. But sometimes God's command is just sit still and see what I can do and see what I will do. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, you're, you'd be familiar with this, but Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. They came to the place where it looked like they were trapped, the Red Sea. No escape, the Egyptians were coming. And God said, through Moses, just stand still and see what God does. See how he delivers and takes care of. And of course, you know that story. And so the command uh, in verse 8 was to get up and go. And in verse 9, we see this. Uh, again, arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and Dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, sometimes we forget about this verse because we get down here to the place where uh, Elijah says to this widow woman, uh, I want you to get me some water and a cake. And we look at that, that's kind of harsh. But we forget God's already commanded her to take care of him. This is, nothing catches God by surprise. He knows what's taking place. So he's commanded to go there, and it's a strange command because Zarephath is a Gentile nation. It's the country of Jezebel. It's a land of idolaters. It's a wicked place filled with wicked place. And to get there from his brook, Elijah will march over 100 miles through territory ruled over by King Ahab who is probably now looking for him. You remember what he did when he stood before him? And he told them no more rain. He, in effect, was, a challenge, was challenging their God. So think about this for a moment. He's got to go to a place that's ungodly through a territory where a wicked king is looking for him and on a surface this command of God seems to make no sense at all you know sometimes this we forget that we don't have to understand everything that God directs us to do, we just have to do it. Let me give you a simple example because we want to think about ourselves. I, I think I, I remember a verse in the Bible that says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Is there one like that? I thought there was. I, I, I kind of remember that. Have you ever heard anybody say, I just can't do that? That's, that's not in my makeup. That's not the thing that I could do. And so to you, the command of God makes no sense. We forget. With God's command comes God's enabling. 
We're never going to come up short if we go at where God directs us. Going to Zarephath will illustrate the weakness of Jezebel's wrath and power and of Ahab. Over the life, often the life of faith is going to lead you through some difficult paths. The reality is if you're going to serve God, the devil will never forget your address. He'll always have a way to try to sidetrack you, to discourage you, to bring you to defeat. But remember this. When the command of God makes no sense, faith simply obeys without regard to the consequences. Look down to verse 10 for a moment. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So we see this about Elijah. Didn't matter what Jezebel thought. Didn't matter what Ahab thought. It didn't matter what the people were like. God said, Go there. And so he went. And you can see this attitude of people of faith throughout the Bible. When God says something that doesn't make sense, yet they still do it and God blesses. For example, Noah and the ark. It had never rained. They weren't around the ocean. God said, I want you to build an ark. All kinds of sermons have been preached about how people would make fun of him building that ark, taking that time to build it. But God knew what he was doing and he prepared his man ahead of time. Abraham and Isaac, when they go up to, up to Mount Moriah and God says, I want you to offer your son. And Abraham was willing to do that even though it didn't make sense because God had promised to make this son his heir. Well, we know that God provided himself a lamb there. What about Daniel and the Hebrews? In Daniel, the book of Daniel. It was hard to do the right thing. It was hard for Daniel to get out on the balcony and pray when the command was, what well, you don't do that. But he did the right thing. And God took care of him. You see, sometimes the circumstances are not easy that you're going to face. But we always have a God that can control the circumstances. And we should never falter in that. Well, there's a challenge for him in verse 9 uh, that I, I want to go back to. Uh, excuse me. Uh, can't think of the, the verse. Um, God tells him, I'm going to just not take time to do that. I've got the wrong verse written down here. But the challenge is to go there and dwell. Remember last week when we talked about the brook? The word dwell means a living place a place to stay. Now, we don't know how long he stayed at the brook, but we know that he's going to stay the duration of this drought with this widow. Somewhere up to three years that he's going to do that. He's told to dwell there. This is the place where you're going to live for this period of time. And you're to stay there until you receive some new instructions. Oh, this is where our impatience comes in, isn't it? This is where the testing really gets tough because God's instructions and God's promises 
do not always come with the time limits. We like to have everything scheduled, don't we? We like to know when things are going to happen. But God doesn't always work that way. And so he tells Elijah just to dwell there until I tell you different. And the real challenge is not in what God told the, or is in what God told the prophet next. He said, behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, in those days, widows were the poorest of the poor. They didn't have government to take care of. And unless they had children that were providing for them, they had a rough time. And so, God's in effect saying to Elijah, I'm sending to you to another place of testing where you'll have to look to me for all that you receive every day. Now, the name Zarephath means smelting, furnace, or refining. And Zarephath is going to be the place where Elijah is going to be refined. The last vestiges of his pride and his self-reliance will be stripped away. I want to tell you, as we look at the idea of learning and growing, until our pride is removed, until our confidence in ourself is not more than our confidence in God, we're going to have struggles and we'll be defeated. But God's going to remove all that away from him. We want to believe that we can handle things, don't we? We always like to think that. I can handle it myself. And then when we get in a real problem, then we go to the Lord. But all along, we should be trusting him. When the Lord begins to work in your life to reveal himself to you in a more, uh, more clearly... He'll send you to a place like Zarephath where you have to depend on him. There you'll learn who's in control. Now we all face the challenge of getting to the place where we're trusting God and him alone for all of our needs in life. We all face that challenge. And it's a hard lesson to learn. God will take care of you. God will provide for me. God will lead me. God will direct me. And then we say, but I will do this and I will do this. No, we have to get to the place where it's all him and not us. And so the comfort is provided in verse 10 and 11. He arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now, Elijah does not hesitate. When he arrives, he sees the woman. God's already told him that he's commanded her to take care of him. And he sees her picking up sticks. And he seems to know that this is the woman that God is talking about. This is the vessel that God has chosen to sustain him. Now, remember this. Our God is a God that works on both ends of the line. He worked with Elijah back at the brook, but as, as he's moving him, he's already instructed this widow to take care of him. God does that. We see that throughout the scriptures. When Jacob and his sons needed food, God had already provided through Joseph in Egypt. They had no idea that it was Joseph at that time, but God was working both ends. 
when the children of Israel sent spies to Jericho, God gave them a Rahab. When the Jews faced Haman, God uh, raised up an Esther. When the Ethiopian eunuch needed salvation, God sent him a Philip. And when your time of need arises, we can rest assured that our, our Heavenly Father has already gone ahead to spread the table of provision on your behalf. My God shall supply all your need through Christ Jesus. He supplies. And then we have this fantastic promise. Uh, but notice what happens in verse 12 first. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Her fear seems to be brought to the surface. Now we know in verse 9, God had already commanded her to take care of his prophet. So one of two things is happening here. She's looking at the circumstances and not at God who controls the circumstances. Or she is looking at Elijah and saying, I'm going to find out if this is the person God told me about. I don't know which way to take it. But I can tell you this, God was working through her and she was willing when Elijah spoke out and said, go do it. She did. So if we take it that she's looking at the circumstances, then I think it makes us look at ourselves a little closer. Are you guilty of looking at the problems that you have and not the provider? Are we more guilty of seeing the circumstances instead of the God who's in control of all? Elijah was sent to Zarephath for his benefit, but he was also sent for her benefit. We always talk about Elijah, but it's not just Elijah that's going to eat all this time. It's this widow lady and her son. She needed to learn the value of faith also. Even though God had told her, if she was doubting, she is now going to see that faith overcomes all. But let me ask you a question. Are you trapped in doubt? Does it appear that your situation to you is hopeless and that you are helpless to do anything about it? The answer lies in looking beyond your problem, getting your eyes on the provider. Hebrews chapter 12 uh, commands us or teaches us that we're to look to the author and finisher of our faith. We're to look to Jesus. Where are you looking in your circumstances? God is your father if you're saved and he has promised to take care of you as he takes care of the fowls of the air or the, the grass of the field God hasn't changed he's still on the throne but when you and I doubt we're saying this we may not use these words but this is what we're saying God can't do it. God can't take care of it. And so that uh, uh, puts us to a place where we think God can't do what he promised. Doubt says that God can't. But faith recognizes his power and position and his abilities. Elijah believed God more than he believed even what he saw. 
You see, real faith knows that God can make the impossible possible. Hebrews 11.1 1 teaches us that our faith is the evidence of things not seen. So the command here in verse 13 and 14 of Elijah appears to be the coldest command or demand in the Bible. He tells her to go ahead and fix her last supper, but feed him first. Now it's interesting, the wording here, feed me and then feed yourself, but she said, I only have enough for one cake. Elijah's letting her know that God is still in control and there's still answers. It involved encouragement when he did this. In verse 13, uh, he said, fear not. You don't have to worry about it. God's going to take care of it. It involved enlightenment. Thus saith the Lord in verse 14. It involved excitement. Uh, Neither the barrel of meal nor the cruise of oil will fail until God sends rain upon the earth. God calls upon our lives sometimes and often makes demands that are difficult to understand from a human perspective. Have you ever said, why would God ask me to do that? Or why would I allow, why would the Lord allow this to happen in my life when God demands are accompanied by a clear word of God then we should have no fear knowing he will take care of us and in verse 15 we see the decision she went and did according uh, to the saying of Elijah and she and he and her house did eat many days God had instructed her but it still took some faith to use the last bit of meal she had to prepare for a total stranger but this is the place where God wants to bring us he wants his Elijah's and his widows to learn uh, to trust him in every circumstance regardless of outward appearances And if you have not reached that place in your walk with God, don't be surprised when God's path leads you through dark valleys and uncertain ways in training. He is in the process of training his servant. You can do no better than to learn to obey him promptly. God wants us to get to the place where we can give it all away. There's a legend about a man who was lost in the desert. He stumbled upon an old rusty pump. He stumbled over to it, grabbed the handle, began to pump. Pumped up and down, but nothing came out. Disappointed, he staggered back. And then he noticed off to the side an old jug. It had a message, it said, you have to prime the pump with all the water in this jug. My friend, P.S., be sure you fill the jug again when you leave. He popped the cork out of the jug, and sure enough, it was almost full of water. He faced a decision now. If he drank the water, he could live. If he poured all the water into the old rusty pump, maybe it would yield fresh cool water from down deep and all the water that he wanted should I waste the water that I have not knowing for sure what I'm going to get reluctantly he poured all the water into the pump and began to pump and as the pump began to squeak At first, nothing came out, and then a little bit of dribble, and then a small stream, and finally it gushed to his relief. Fresh, cool water poured out of the rusty pump. Eagerly, he filled the jug and drank from it. He filled it another time and once again drank its contents. Then he filled the jug for the next traveler, 
He filled it to the top, popped the cork on, and added this note. Believe me, it really works. You have to give all away before you can get anything back. You see, faith calls upon us to do the unthinkable, to receive the impossible. And so we have a fabulous provision here in verse 15 and verse 16. The supply never ran out. The meal barrel and the jar of oil did not run out. Every time the widow went to get it, to get meal and oil, there was more to be used. Think of this, how God's grace is. You don't have to always know where tomorrow's coming from. You just need to know who's providing. But because this widow took God at his word, prepared bread for Elijah, God allowed the widow, her son, and Elijah to enjoy plenty all around them while hundreds were starving to death. God honors faith, and faith honors God. And there's some greatness here. Every mealtime was a miracle. God took nothing and made it last until it was no longer needed. You see, we serve a God who specializes in the impossible. He can take the little that you have that is dedicated to him by faith and multiply it to enormous proportions. Remember the little boy with five loaves and two fishes? What a miracle. God fed the multitude. And then there's the glory. The glory of the story resides in the fact, I believe the barrel of meal and the crews of oil were never full. Never says it was, it just said they never ran out. Think about the, how God works. When God provided manna and quail for Israel in the wilderness, there was plenty on the ground. Were they allowed to pick up enough for the next day? Or the next week? No. God provided fresh every day. They didn't need tomorrow's provision if they're trusting God. I don't think they needed tomorrow's provision because they were trusting God. When God has brought you to a place where you're forced to trust him for today's provision, he has brought you to the best place that you can ever be. When its path leads to a greater trial, it's a blessing to know that God always takes care of his children. Many of you have heard of George Mueller. Let me tell you his story. George Mueller was born into a German tax collector's family, was often in trouble. He learned early to steal and gamble and drink. As a teenager, he learned how to stay in expensive hotels, then sneak out without paying the bill. At length, he was caught and jailed. Prison did him little good, for upon his release, he continued his crime spree until on a Saturday night in 1825, he met Jesus Christ. Mueller married and settled down in Bristol, England, growing daily in faith and developing a burden for the homeless children running wild and ragged through the streets. At a public meeting in Bristol on December 9, 1835, he presented a plan for an orphanage. Several contributions came in. Mueller rented number six Wilson Street and on April 11, 1836, the doors of the orphanage opened. 26 children were immediately taken in. And a house, second house was soon opened, then a third. From the very beginning, Mueller refused to ask for funds or to even speak of the ministry's financial needs. He believed in praying and praying earnestly, trusting God to provide. And the Lord did provide, though sometimes it was at the last minute. The best known story involves a morning when the plates and bowls and cups 
were set on the tables. But there was no food nor milk. The children sat waiting for breakfast while Mueller led in prayer for their daily bread. A knock sounded at the door. It was the baker. Mr. Mueller, he said, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have enough bread for breakfast, so I got up at 2 a.m. and baked some fresh bread. A second now knock sounded. The milkman had broken down right in front of the orphanage, and he wanted to give the children his milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. Such stories were pretty much the norm in his ministry and work. During the course of his 93 years, Mueller housed more than 10,000 orphans, prayed in millions of dollars, traveled to scores of country preaching the gospel, and recorded uh, 50,000 answers to prayer. You know what? We have that same God. What's the difference between you and me and Mueller? Maybe we're trusting too much in ourselves instead of looking him, to him to supply when we go to Dry Brook University, our empty barrel graduate school. Maybe we're looking to ourselves for the answers instead of looking to him. Let's stand for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment, maybe God would be speaking to your heart tonight. Maybe, just maybe, you're in a barren valley. It's dry, no rain. It seems that there's no answers. You don't know where to turn. I want to tell you, turn to God. He has the answers. He has the supply. He has the provision. He knows how to take care of you and me. God's still on the throne. Tonight as God speaks to your heart, here's a place for you to pray a time to come to the Lord. Take that burden, take that problem, take that confusion and lay it on the altar. Give it to him and let him take care of you. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing tonight. We thank you for those who have come to your house. And I pray that you supply each of their needs as they trust you for it. Some are going through financial problems, I'm sure. Others may be family problems. Others going through things that we would don't even have a clue about. Help them to know there's a place where you provide, where you take care, and you want them to learn to trust you. We ask your blessing upon this time of invitation, for we know of your care and your provision. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.